last of the long-awaited event. America has her satellite in orbit. The space race was on, including a race for space weapons. Space weapons feature prominently in science fiction, but how close are we to seeing real weapon systems in space? Fiction did aspire to become fact when President Ronald Reagan My fellow Americans announced his Star Wars plan. Effort ...which holds the promise of changing the course of human history. I ask for your prayers and your support. Thank you. Good night. When I joined the staff of the Committee on Armed Services in the U.S. House of Representatives uh, back in 1985, my first assignment was to investigate and oversee the Strategic Defense Initiative. This was President Ronald Reagan's Star Wars program. This new national strategy represents a break from the dangerous policy of mutual assured destruction. In Reagan's version of Star Wars, the newly designed space shuttle would deploy his version of the Force. When our reconnaissance systems verify a Soviet launch, U.S. interceptors are fired as Level 1 defense goes into action. Batteries of weapons would be positioned in orbit to target enemy nuclear missiles before they reached U.S. territory. At the time, the prevailing view was that this was going to work, that the technology was almost in hand, and that this was going to change everything. I remember the briefing I got from my staff director who said, N not just anti-missile systems, but all major weapon systems were going to move to space, that space was the new high ground, even then we talked about it in that way, where, where all major military operations were going to be by the, the end of that century. It was a debate of stellar proportions. Many scientists, including me, believed the plan was nonsense. It cannot protect the population of the United States. It can be, by the Soviets, overwhelmed, outfoxed, underflown. I, for one, am not willing and able to just accept the idea that it can't work. Reagan's plans to deploy weapons in space were too ambitious, and most of them never left the drawing board. But the U.S. military remained convinced the plans could succeed. At the turn of the 21st century, Star Wars would resurface, but under a different name. Under President George W. Bush, it was called missile defense. We need a new framework that allows us to build missile defenses to counter the different threats of today's world. I hope we'll also move forward on ballistic missile defense cooperation. We must develop and we must deploy effective missile defenses. Back in 2000, when President Bush took office, he and his cadre of people that surrounded him, you think of Paul Wolfowitz, you think of Donald Rumsfeld, yeah, you think of Dick Cheney, all of them really only had two priorities. One was to get rid of Saddam Hussein. The second was to build a missile defense system. Good morning. I've just concluded a meeting of my National Security Council. We reviewed what I've discussed with my friend, President Vladimir Putin over the course of many meetings, and many months, and that is the need for America to move beyond the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. When George W. Bush became president, immediately he gave six-month notice to Russia that we're pulling out, the United States is pulling out of the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, that limited the United States' ability to test and deploy anti-satellite weapons, so-called missile defense systems, and other space technology. At the Pentagon today, a warning that space will become the next big battlegrounds. To meet the challenge, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld is making space a top Pentagon priority, putting a four-star general at the head of a new Air Force Space Command to take charge of all military space activity, including any new anti-missile defense. We pay careful attention to protecting promoting our interest in space. Pentagon officials say it's the first step toward eventually putting weapons into space. 
But what exactly is a space weapon? Is it always space-based? Trying to track down what the Defense Department is spending on space weapons projects is a tricky business. At the Starfire Optical Range, the Air Force Research Laboratory is testing advanced land-based lasers. Starfire has been used primarily in the past to do research on satellite tracking. Also, they've done a lot of work in astronomy with range finding of stars. You use the laser to be able to help tell you where the star is and how far away it is. In the budget documents from the Air Force, there has also been mention of the use of Starfire for anti-satellite weapons activities. The Air Force told Congress that it had no intentions of using Starfire for anything related to anti-satellite weapons. However, they are doing a test to make the laser beam very skinny and make it stay very stable as it goes up, and they're going to target that on a satellite. If you're tracking a satellite, you don't need a very skinny laser beam. In fact, you want kind of a wide one because you, you want to be, make sure you catch it in the view, right? So uh, many of us here are concerned that this kind of a test is actually an anti-satellite weapons test in disguise. In April of 2005, the Air Force launched an experimental satellite. Its name was the XSS-11. Theoretically, this experimental microsatellite has the ability to disrupt other nations' satellites. Has it done so? No. Could it do so? En principe, okay? But in reality, we don't know. One of the things that I think people need to know is that most technology that's used in space can be used either for weapons purposes or it can be used for totally benign good purposes. Lasers for tracking, good idea, more precise tracking. Um, small microsatellites that can go around a big satellite and take pictures. Good idea, because it helps you figure out what went wrong with your satellite, and that's hard to do right now. Good idea. That same little microsatellite that's going around the big satellite could be sent up to go around another person's satellite and run into it and kill it. The technology doesn't know whether it's a weapon or whether it's a, you know, a benign use. The question is going to come down to the intent of the people who are building these systems. In simulated missile defense combat situations like this one, rogue nations launch nuclear missiles at major American cities. I have a valid missile event. I agree, that's a valid event. You have two for track. Zero, but in zero, reality, zero, one, who would launch six, such six, intercontinental six, missile attacks against the U.S.? Possible impact in San Francisco, sir. Cue the X-band platform for long-range tracks over the pole. X-band platform is queued. The interesting thing is that the threat is actually shrinking, not increasing. The ballistic missile threat is declining. There are far fewer ballistic missiles in the world now than there were 15 years ago. There are fewer countries with ballistic missile programs. There are fewer hostile countries to the United States with ballistic missile programs. Um, when you start, when you look at it, it really comes down to a, to a handful of states whose programs we, we worry about, North Korea and Iran, basically, and they only have medium-range missiles. That is, they can't reach the United States. Four administrations have succeeded Ronald Reagan's. All of them, Republican and Democrat, have endorsed missile defense under a variety of names for a total cost of $200 billion. Although President Obama did scrap plans for an anti-ballistic missile shield in Eastern Europe. It's a con. It's a con. Missile defense is the greatest fraud in the Department of Defense. And believe me, it's had a lot of competitors. I, I really... I, I really believe this. I, I, missile defense is the longest-running fraud 
in the in the history of the U.S. Department of Defense. But what if missile defense was another way of funding space weaponry? In March 2008, the U.S. used its missile defense system to destroy one of its own disabled satellites. Missile interceptors launched from Earth and also called kill vehicles now offer the capability of obliterating any satellite in low Earth orbit. Missile defense is a Trojan horse. It has nothing to do with defense whatsoever. It's all about projecting power. It's about offense. I've been to the bases in Colorado Springs, and I've personally seen over the door where it says Master of Space. And I've read the documents, Vision for 2020, and a whole array of other military Space Command documents that have said for years that the U.S. will control space, that we will dominate space, that we will deny other countries access to space. We, 5% of the world's population in the United States, are going to deny other countries access to space. I mean, absolutely provocative. I would tell you that uh, we are so dominant in space that uh, uh, I pity a country that uh, would come up against us. Um, the synergy with air, land, and sea forces and, uh, and our ability to control the battle space and seize the high ground is devastating. Real 38 at Ascension. 78, after take forms open, comments good. We got no open jobs until 1727 and no open business. In making their claim to dominate space, the Americans have staked a mysterious new battleground. Space is getting busier, and it's not just with communication satellites. The U.S. military is developing what the Air Force in particular has called prompt global strike. Uh, that is basically, currently we have uh, nuclear missiles that could strike anywhere on Earth within 30 minutes. What the military is talking about is a similar conventional capability that could be used to knock out, say, a Chinese anti-satellite weapons launcher in a matter of minutes. A number of concepts are being studied with this notion of prompt global strike. Uh, one is a uh, orbiting space plane that would have the capability to be able to maneuver and also to fire weapons at a much faster pace than is currently the case. One is a uh, orbiting space satellite that would actually have uh, missiles on it that could be fired uh, from space uh, and reach a target uh, in literally uh, five to ten minutes as opposed to uh, the current 30 minutes Satellite-based missiles would park weapons in space. Satellites can identify a target through overhead imagery, process communications about the target between military decision makers, and then guide a bomb precisely enough to destroy the target with one shot. Would it really be that big a step if a projectile itself were also launched from space? There's no practical difference, and I'd venture to say that the person on the receiving end wouldn't see the distinction either. There's a long-standing UN treaty which bans only nuclear weapons in space. But these space-based conventional missile systems could be as devastating as nuclear warheads. The Pentagon has said that moving the arms race into space will be the largest industrial project in the history of the planet Earth. They can't take any chances. They have to have an enemy. They have to make the people afraid. Someone's going to attack us with nuclear weapons. We've got to 